We are continuing our adventures in food labeling, and today we are going to talk about allergen declarations on food packages. And as you know, um, making sure that when we are preparing food products, it's absolutely critical that we are mitigating risks. And one of the risks is to uh, from food allergens in the products. And as such, we have to be doing our appropriate due diligence. This a uh, series of slideshows is about food labeling. And so we're going to specifically talk about the food labeling um, requirements for allergen labeling. We're not going to be talking about GMPs for allergen management and um, hygiene and testing practices. That's for another time and in another class. But I do want to talk about what is what does a label look like and what are the requirements necessary under the Canadian regulations. So at the end of this video, you'll be able to define the priority allergens for Canadian food products as defined by Health Canada. And we'll describe the word formats permitted for labeling allergens and foods and we'll use, of course, the Canadian uh, context. And we're going to define the prescribed name format for labeling of allergen sources. So let's just jump right in here. As we know, uh, this whole series of videos has been derived from the Guide to Food Labeling for Industry, and I do highly recommend that you um, follow along in the Guide to Food Labeling for Industry to understand what are the guidance um, requirements for labeling. And I always encourage young food scientists to use the Guide to Food Labeling for Industry and the CFIA guidance documents as their first frame of reference. And even those of us who have been around the block a few times and have been doing this for years, we still go back to these documents time and time again because the, the regulations change. I remember teaching this course a few years ago and they changed the priority allergens in the middle of the course. And because we were going back to the reference documents, we were able to quickly adapt and we were able to uh, get right back on track because we had the practice in mind to go to the guidance and the regulations every single time. So just the core uh, regulatory principle here is that food allergens and gluten must be declared in the list of ingredients in which they are present or in a food allergen source, gluten source, and added sulfide statement. And so we're going to parse through what does this regulation mean, but uh, just a quick note here. When you see one of these numbers, B01, 010.1 section 2 FDR. FDR just stands for Food and Drugs Regulation and this is the actual legal clause from which this statement has been pulled. So just get used to that. The Food and Drugs Regulation is available to you as a as a citizen and you can look it up and you can cut and paste these uh, these clauses when you find them so that you can go to the actual regulation and and pull it up. The regulations aren't, they're not there to be hidden away in books and never used. They're meant to be accessed frequently. And so just get used to it and have some fun with it. Um, but let's just jump forward here. The next, the next uh, reference that I want to bring up is this one. If a contains statement, and that uh, I cut and paste this from the guidance document, but that contains statement likely should be in uh, um, apostrophes. If a contained statement is used on a label, all allergen, gluten, and added sulfite information must appear in the statement at least once, even if that information is already shown in the list of ingredients for the product. And we'll talk about this in a minute, but oftentimes when you get a food product, it will say contains, uh, the box uh, that I've got the stock image from says contains wheat and milk. Well, this, um, this implies that if you're using that contains statement, and in this case it says contains wheat and milk here, that you have also had those um, those uh, pieces of information appearing in the statement at least once already, even if it's already in the ingredients in that product. So up here um, we've got all sorts of different ingredients, but if we're using that contained statement, we can't just randomly forget to include certain allergens because we've listed them in the ingredient declaration already. So quick summary, 
What are the priority allergens in Canada? Well, uh, based off of current situation, this is 2021. Um, the current priority allergens are eggs, milk, mustard, peanuts, crustaceans and mollusks, fish, sesame seeds, soy, sulfites. And sulfites is a unique one because we do actually have a concentration threshold. And so it's sulfites above 10 parts per million. If you have um, naturally occurring sulfites less than 10 parts per million or added sulfites less than 10 parts per million because they've been diluted out um, because it's a minor ingredient within a food product, then they do not need to be included. The other exception to the rule is if you have a vintage wine and this was bottled before the regulation changed, then you are permitted to have it as a unlabeled sulfites. Last but not least, we've got tree nuts, and that includes almonds, brizzle nuts, cashews, hazelnuts, macadamia nuts, pecans, pine nuts, pistachios, and walnuts. Something that's interesting is that here in Canada, we do not classify coconut as a tree nut. However, in the United States, coconut is classified as a tree nut and therefore is labeled as an allergen. Here in Canada, we have not deemed it as a priority allergen. Last but not least, wheat and triticale. And we label these as allergens. In a moment, I'm going to talk about gluten because gluten is a separate category and we do label gluten sources as well. Um, now, you likely know someone who has an allergy to, I don't know, strawberries or an allergy to peaches or an allergy to, I, personally, I'm allergic to uh, celery and uh, insect foods. I've had some interesting reactions to eating crickets. And as such... You may be saying, well, wait a second, why aren't those listed as allergens? The list of priority allergens has arisen because of epidemiologic evidence. Epidemiology is just the study of the patterns of uh, diseases and um, different symptoms. And in the case of Health Canada declaring a food substance as a priority allergen, what they are doing is they're looking at the balance between what are the allergens that are out there. And honestly, if you look far and wide, you will find someone who's allergic to pretty much anything or everything that's out there versus the economic impact of these allergens within the public health sector. And so the allergens that are listed as priority allergens are ones that are routinely showing up in the broader population. This list has changed over time. Mustard did not used to be on this list. There has been some dialogue about whether other legumes, um, not just soy, but things like lupins, whether they should be on the list of allergens because we're starting to see more food, uh, including lupins. Um, onions and garlic have been considered as uh, potential priority allergens. And so this is, again, another reason why I highly encourage people to go back to the source documents because the policies often do change. And what is required in terms of food stuff to be listed may change over time. And so don't be surprised if two or three years from now, I have to make a new video because this list will change. I guarantee it. Now we do have gluten sources. And gluten sources, what's interesting is we have some grains on here that are not actual uh, from their from their. Uh, biochemistry, they do not create gluten. So oats, for example, oats in their pure form do not create gluten. However, oats in most of the Canadian and, and actually the global grain handling system are, are frequently cross-contaminated with wheat or other gluten-containing grains. Barley, rye, and triticale, and some of the other uh, minor grains like kamut and spelt, they do naturally contain small amounts of gluten. And as such, they are in that gluten source, whereas oats, there are a few um, dedicated oat processing facilities and they will do a certified gluten-free oat. But in general, the, the main oat supply in Canada is considered to be contaminated with wheat because we use shared handling facilities. And as such, it is labeled as a gluten source unless it's certified otherwise. Now, thank you to our friends at the CFIA. These are... Uh, 
taken from their website and I will share the link with you in the YouTube video uh, description so that you can follow along here as well. Now, how do we label them? We are going to, in some cases, we can label them within the ingredients list. And so using the CFI's example here, let's say we are making apple pie. We've got apples, we've got pie crust, and in our pie crust, we've got flour, which contains wheat. And we've got shortening liquid albumin. Liquid albumin would be uh, a veiled name for eggs. And we've got salt and then we've got sugar flour well we've already declared flour already once and so we've got that wheat statement there lemon juice whole milk and cinnamon and then we've got a may contains pecans down here so we can do it embedded within the ingredients list but what we're seeing more commonly is this contains statement because it it isolates the allergens out and it creates it into a very discrete highlighted format and so instead in our ingredient statement will stay apples pie crust flour shortening liquid albumin salt sugar flour lemon juice whole milk and cinnamon and then we've got a contains wheat egg and milk and then we have a may contain statement we'll talk about the the politics of the may contain statement in a minute here this format here this secondary format is becoming more and more common because especially if you've got a composed product with dozens of ingredients it's very clear for someone who requires that allergen um, scrutiny to be able to quickly identify what allergens are in there they can scroll right to the end of the ingredient list and see that contained statement so if you have a packaged food with priority allergens or glutens or sulfates they have to be at least once at least once in the list of ingredients so we noted that flour was here again, and so it was listed once, therefore we do not necessarily have to repeat it. You are not wrong to repeat it. However, as long as it is there once, it can be there. Now, priority food allergens, gluten sources, and added sulfites must be declared when they are components as well. And that component piece of the puzzle is, is, is uh, interesting in that oftentimes I get questions from the industry is there an order in which you have to follow and honestly there's not a rank order for how these have to be declared but if they are in the components they do have to be declared and so we've talked a lot in some previous slideshows about well if I have components and they're exempt from ingredient labeling do does that mean it's exempt from allergen labeling as well and the clear answer is no. If your ingredient has components, but it's exempt from component labeling and it has an allergen, well, you have to declare that allergen. You can't hide your allergens within components. Just don't. Don't do it. <laughs> um, make sure that they're listed out there. Now, cross-contamination statements, or what, are, or what we better know as precautionary statements, that is where you are going to put in food allergens that are not intentionally added. So in the case of this apple pie, maybe we are in a facility that also makes pecan pie. And as good as we are doing our sanitation and as good as our hygiene practices are, there still may be residual pecans on our equipment that may cause a cross-contamination issue. And because we do not have a, a capability of validating that there is no pecan residue in our apple pie, then as a precautionary cross-contamination statement, we would put may contains pecans. And you can't go about and just put these may contains on everything because you are lazy about sanitation. You have to show that you're still using good manufacturing practices and using good sanitation and hygiene practices but from, the, from a, a, a logical perspective, it's very difficult to eliminate all allergens if you are handling it at one point of time during production and then having an, uh, a product that doesn't contain it intentionally. It's very difficult. I think of uh, some factories that I've been in that have made sesame seed uh, coated buns and sesame seeds just end up everywhere and despite all of the efforts of having sesame seed free product those sesame seeds are just everywhere and 
As such, it is far better for them to have a precautionary statement may contain sesame seeds on their non-sesame seed product because of that. Um, let's jump ahead here and move along. As I, you know me, I could talk and talk and talk about this topic forever. So food allergens, gluten sources, and added sulfites can also be listed in a contained statement right after the list of ingredients. So the previous examples, we had the word highlighted within the ingredient statement. And what we do see is that these contains statements are becoming much more common as um, the allergen Reg, uh, the allergen requirements for labeling are uh, becoming much more um, standardized within Canada. So uh, the contained statement, as long as you have covered off every single priority allergen that's within your product, you do not then have to highlight them within your list of ingredients within a bracketed form. So that priority allergen, you have to use the prescribed name. You can't go about and call it, I don't know, uh, triticum estivum or um, ovid secretions or whatever. You can't, you can't just, uh, like, maybe you are working with walnuts and you can't just decide to call them marzagardu, which is the name in Farsi. You have to use the prescribed plain language name that is uh, set out in the Food and Drugs Regulation, and we'll, we'll I'll jump to that summary table in just a moment. And so, especially we see this in um, many products that are being imported into Canada, and perhaps the label is being translated. You have to go back to the uh, the, the plain prescribed name. So you can't you can't call milk um, cow secretions or something weird like that. It has to be called milk. And so that, that uh, precautionary statement should be referring back to the priority food allergen or gluten source. And again, it's tempting. Uh, oftentimes, oftentimes people will say, well, I personally am allergic to bananas. Therefore, I want to put a may contains bananas statement on this product. That it does refer back to the priority allergen. And so uh, from a regulatory perspective, Health Canada doesn't want us to start labeling everything as a potential allergen. It still does need to remain within that may contains a priority food allergen or gluten source, not just any random may contains. Now, there are what are known as these prescribed source names, and most of them are very, very logical. But you do need to be aware, especially if you're in the import business and you're bringing in products and having to translate labels, you do need to put the uh, ingredient into that that second tier name here may contains this and you can't obfuscate it into a weird weird name and 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 back when the regulations were first changing there were lots of times where uh, companies were like well could I just uh, uh, like please one don't kill people allergens can kill people and I'm not I realize I'm not talking about uh, food allergy, there's lots of resources out there. I want to talk specifically about the labeling requirements, but don't try and hide food safety issues by using label obfuscation. Just name it plain and simple. And it's it's not it's not complicated, but don't try and hide things. Please, please, please be aware of how you are labeling and make sure that you're putting it in a plain language. Now, as I mentioned, this is just labeling training. There's lots more to learn about allergen GMP. Um, we, we've mentioned it that if you've got an allergen within that component, if that allergen has a may contain statement, that may contain statement carries forward to your product as well. And so you do need to be aware of those sorts of things. This is just an introduction to the labeling requirements, and there's so much more to learn. And I encourage you to keep discovering more. Find out more about uh, good manufacturing practices, find out about testing methods, find out about cross-contamination prevention and hygiene. There's so much more to allergens. This is just about labeling. So I think, again, my reminder to you, always go back to the source documents to make sure that you have the most up-to-date information possible. And that will also provide you um, excellent guidance on how to interpret the regulations. 
Anyways, I think this is the end of this slideshow for today. I am going to jump out for some more slideshows on how do we do this in Esha. And we will always gladly uh, take your comments and questions. I've had some fun email conversations with different people about the labeling software. Love to hear that you're learning and you're growing and you're making your businesses better and you are making yourself smarter in the process. Take care and we'll talk to you again soon.